Welcome to the Dublin City Libraries podcast. In this episode, entitled Prostitution in Dublin in the Early 20th Century, Dublin City historian in residence Mary Muldowney explores how prostitution became entangled with the cause of Irish independence, as it was framed, not as a social issue, but as a symbol of degeneracy of the British Empire. Recorded at the Central Library in October 2022. The problem of prostitution as a solution to poverty certainly isn't a new one, but during the late 19th century and the early years of the 20th century, it became associated with the major political upheavals that were ongoing in Ireland, not least in Dublin. And this was because prostitution, unlikely as it might seem, became entangled with the cause of Irish independence. I'll explain how in a while. So from 1900 until the founding of the new state in 1922, (coughs) prostitution was discussed not primarily as a social issue, but as a symbol of the degeneracy of the British Empire, which was said to be embodied particularly in British soldiers. So as a city in which poverty was rife, that was also a seaport and the site of several barracks where garrisons were stationed there was both a significant number of women involved in prostitution and a ready market for their services. In Irish cities, renaming streets associated with prostitution was relatively common, going back to mid-19th century, because clearly, if you didn't actually name it, maybe it wasn't happening. So this happened, you know, that that trend increased somewhat in the early years of the 20th century. Anderson's Row in Belfast was noted as an area of immorality because it became Millfield Place in December 1860 and it didn't improve its reputation. In 1885, Lower Temple Street in Dublin became Hill Street in consequence of a similar attempt to changed the reputation of the area and this followed a memorial or a petition to the corporation for a number of inhabitants of the street who had suffered serious deterioration in the value of their property as certain houses in the lower end of the street which become what's now Cornell Street were occupied by immoral characters and that's a quotation not my opinion. So in 1888 Dublin Corporation renamed Mecklenburg Street, Tyrone Street, to please the respectable working class residents of the area. And later, Tyrone Street was to become Railway Street, which it still is. So the Mecklenburg Montgomery district of the city, northeast of the Custom House, marked the infamous Monto district. And I'm sure we've all heard the song at some stage, but I'm not going to attempt to repeat it here. So by 1911, the renaming of streets in this area, so Waterford Street and Railway Street, remaining notorious. And while Tyrone Street, as Railway Street had been, was the most infamous street in the area with a considerable number of brothels, the adjoining streets, Foley Street, Montgomery Street, Mabbott Street, Beaver Street, Purden Street, Elliott Place, Faithful Place, Uxbridge and Nickelby were almost as disreputable. Now, if you don't recognise some of those names, it's because they've since been completely demolished. But in this slide, actually, that's Foley Street, which was formerly Montgomery Street and the centre of the Monto. But just to give you an idea of the number of soldiers who are stationed in the city, this is just in the immediate, what would now be the inner city area of Dublin. So you've got Wellington Barracks now, Griffith Barracks, Richmond Barracks, which is in Inchicore, and the Royal Barracks, which is now the museum, and Beggar's Bush. So they were all fairly close to the most populated areas of the city, <coughs> aka the slums. So there were a lot of women, especially. I'm sure there were male prostitutes at that stage, but there's nothing mentioned about them in most of the contemporary documents. And anyway, it was the women who were being exploited to the greatest extent. So um, that, as I said, is now Foley Street. This is a photograph from the 1960s. 
for somebody who loves having photographs as much as I do, it can be frustrating when you're doing the earlier years because you can't find anything. There wasn't a great deal of interest in photographing the slum areas until after the Church Street collapse when there were a lot of photographs taken of the tenements. So in the final years of the 19th century and into the early decades of the 20th, the British Army in Ireland had an embarrassing prominence among the world's military forces for the prevalence of venereal disease among its ranks. There were roughly 20,000 troops in the country in the first years of this century, of last century, uh, and they had the highest incidence of sexually transmitted diseases in the four countries of the United Kingdom, bar 1903 when they came second to Scotland. So it wasn't an enviable <laughs> reputation to have, and so it played into certain propaganda that started to emerge in these years. In 1904, this man, John Halliday Sutherland, who was studying to be a medical doctor in Dublin at the time, he trained in the Rotunda for a while too. He said he had walked, he later wrote about his time in Ireland, and he was a, an author who did write travel books quite a bit. He said he had walked down one evening down Tyrone Street, and he observed that in no other capital of Europe have I seen its equal. It was a street of Georgian houses, and each one was a brothel. On the steps of every house, women and girls dressed in everything from evening dress to a night dress stood or sat. So while it was in the Monto area that prostitutes in Dublin had been gradually confined from the 1880s, this didn't mean that prostitution didn't exist or was less obvious in other parts of the city. Sackville Street, which is now O'Connell Street, of course, was a principal promenading ground for prostitutes, and many were also found in the Phoenix Park and Stevens Green, and especially around the docks area. A police commissioner reported that prior to 1922, prostitution was mainly confined to a particular area stretching from Summerhill to Talbot Street and from Marlborough Street to the Five Lamps at the junction of Enion Street and Portland Road. So it wasn't that people in that area were particularly prone to um, having to selling their bodies, it was that they often just didn't have a choice. It was one of the poorest areas of the city with incredible tenements on every street. Arrests for prostitution in Dublin rose from 431 in 1900 to a high of 1067 in 1912. And um, I got those figures from Maria Luddy, the Irish academic but based in England. And she wrote a book called Prostitution in Irish Society, 1800 to 1940, which has a lot of fascinating information in it. I wouldn't always agree with her conclusions, but the thing is that if you want the facts, you can totally trust what she says, because she's a really scrupulous historian. So the figures were significantly in excess of the numbers arrested in Belfast which was also a city with huge problems of poverty and prostitution and large numbers of British soldiers and, of course, other garrison towns in Ireland. But Dublin was way out on its own in terms of the numbers. So during the two decades preceding uh, independence, the Dublin newspapers covered the issue of prostitution with a particular focus on the moral health of the city and the nation rather than concerned for the well-being of the women engaged in the sex trade. Until 1910, the complaints tended to be of a general nature and related mainly to the presence of prostitutes and their military clients on Sackville Street and other main thoroughfares. <laughs> Apparently, the site of O'Connell Street, as it is now, opposite the GPO, was where the respectable women didn't walk because they might be mistaken for a prostitute, but that, that was a popular area for walking up and down for women and their clients. The debate was heated up considerably in 1910 when a Jesuit priest, Father Gwynne, gave a lecture to the Catholic Truth Society claiming that lax policing was encouraging, and I quote him, looseness and depravity on the streets of Dublin. 
Reaction to his talk was outrage from those who perceived his claims to be a slur on the city. And of course, at the other extreme, it was welcomed by those who welcomed the fact that light was, as they saw it, being shed on a problem for which they had been seeking a solution for some years. Not a solution, by the way, that would involve trying to reduce the levels of poverty in the city, but in any case, because of the strength of the reaction to Wynne's lecture, the Deputy Lord Mayor called a special meeting in the Mansion House on the 19th of October 1910, which was reported in the Freeman's Journal the next day. Alderman McWalter, the Deputy Mayor, his introductory remarks reflect an attitude to women that was prevalent at the time and unfortunately didn't necessarily disappear with independence. So he said that Dublin was rapidly earning for itself the reputation of being one of the most immoral of cities. He was very far from believing that it was so in reality. But he could speak from experience when he said that the principal streets of London, of Brussels, of the great cities of Germany and France had by no means that air, whatever be the reality of looseness and depravity, which invaded our main thoroughfares with the fall of night. What was the childhood and what were the surroundings of those crowds of young girls who took possession of the centre of the city when the darkness comes? And his whole demeanour by no means suggests the modesty and decorum they were wont to regard as inseparable from the Irish maiden. Foreigners had, to his own knowledge, come to our shores and gone away speaking very plainly of their impressions gained from streets concerning what we once claimed as the special glory of our Irish girls. So various proposals to solve the problem were discussed at the meeting, most of them fairly bizarre. One included a suggestion that if the police weren't doing their job properly and dealing with the problem, then the corporation shouldn't pay them. Industrial schools were suggested as a solution to the problem of children misbehaving on the streets, although it was pointed out that children were far more likely to be mischievous than immoral. The discussion that was reported in the Freeman's Journal stated that the honour of the city was a greater concern than the conditions in which women and children were being forced to live. Alderman Tom Kelly blamed the presence of soldiers and suggested that Dublin should be more like Cork, where the soldiers were forced to behave themselves. So although there was criticism of the existence of the red light district, Monto in Dublin by representatives of various religious sects, most of the more public concern seems to have been raised by Catholic clerics. As the nationalist movement identified closely with the Gaelic revival, the phrase Catholic Ireland became more widespread. A case heard in Dublin's Northern Police Court in July 1901 and reported in the Evening Herald deals with a curious aspect of the preoccupation with religion in relation to perceived immorality. That's DMP, Dublin Metropolitan Policeman. I think that particular one, he was known as the giant. They weren't all that tall. But uh, in any case, the two young boys aged 10 and 13 respectively had been brought before the court because a policeman had found them in a house of ill repute in Montgomery Street, where it emerged they lived with their mother, who claimed she did not know it was a brothel, although she had been renting a room there for the previous two months. The sergeant who took them from their home said he had known the mother for eight years and he would describe her as unfortunate if not quite a prostitute. There is some discussion in the Maria Lenti <coughs> book, which is interesting because she said working class areas, especially where a lot of the brothels were situated, the residents were far more likely to be tolerant and kind to the women whom they described as unfortunate, rather than the kind of hysterical reaction that was coming from middle class people. But most of the examination of the witnesses in this court case focused on the religion of the boys because their mother said they had been raised as Protestant, which was their dead father's religion. Another policeman claimed their older sister said they were Catholics and there was evidence that the mother had got clothing for them from a charity on that basis. 
But rather than concern for the well-being of the children, the sisters only mentioned in terms of giving information about their religion. The preoccupation of the court officers and the policemen was whether or not the two boys were Protestants, because that meant they wouldn't have been sent to an industrial school. Other cases concerning young children also mentioned their religion, including one reported in the Evening Herald, when two young brothers, aged six and eight respectively, were charged with immorality because they were begging on the street near the rotunda. The judge in that case was primarily interested in their mother's clothes, which he said were fit as, quote, for the wife of an older man. She explained she had borrowed them from her sister for her appearance in court. So if you were poor, you couldn't win no matter what you did. So some of those most determined to clean up the streets of the city were advanced <coughs> nationalist women, such as the members of Anina Naharan. They organised street patrols so that so-called respectable women could pass safely without harassment from groups of soldiers who were congregating there. This is a handbill that they produced which illustrates their insistence that consorting with soldiers was unpatriotic and any women who did so should be saved from themselves. There's also a strong element of class prejudice in the language of this and other documents produced at the time. And I've just put some of it there. It's, it's quite difficult to read because it was obviously stained over the years. But it said, Ireland has need of the loving service of all her children. Irish women do not sufficiently realise the power they have to help or hinder the cause of Ireland's freedom. Irish girls who walk with Irish men wearing England's uniform, remember you are walking with traitors. Irish girls who walk with English soldiers, Remember, you are walking with your country's enemies and with men who are unfit to be the companions of any, well girl, any girl, for it is well known that the English army is the most degraded and immoral army in Europe, chiefly recruited in the slums of English cities among men of the lowest and most depraved characters. Anina and the Heron are very anxious to get the cooperation of any girl who reads this handbill and feels she should like to help in working for Ireland's freedom and trying to save innocent country girls from the great danger which their thoughtless association with soldiers exposes them to. So the reference to innocent country girls was presumably aimed at the domestic servants who were often a target of the moral scrutiny of the patrollers rather than the prostitutes, for instance, who were forced to walk the streets, or Phoenix Park or Stevens Green to make a living, or those who worked in the infamous brothels of the Monto. Various vigilance committees emerged before the First World War, and they were particularly concerned with the vulnerability of these girls, who were never referred to as women, who were considered to be particularly naive and in danger of being seduced into vice. The Irish Citizen, the newspaper of the suffrage movement in Ireland, was founded in 1912 to cover both suffrage activities and the labour movement. They were very critical of the false view of Ireland propagated by the daily newspapers and the failure to report the extent of the exploitation of women forced into prostitution by their poverty. Similarly, the Irish Worker, the newspaper of the labour movement, focused on the economic conditions that gave rise to most women's involvement in the sex industry. Both newspapers repeatedly condemned the sexual violence that was often a feature of crowded tenement and street living. They were particularly scathing of the moral purity movement, which ignored the role of Irish men, especially those who came from a higher income bracket. When the white slavery agitation was at its peak in 1912, George Bernard Shaw issued one of the most forceful statements on the reality of the problem. He said, until you change this condition of society, whereby women are more highly paid and better treated as prostitutes than as respectable women, and secure to every respectable woman a sufficient wage with reasonable hours of labour, you will never get rid of the white slavery traffic. 
There are always orphans and widows and girls from the country and abroad who have no family and no husband, and these must submit to the blackest misery that a slum garret and an income from eight pence to one shilling a day can bring to a lonely, despised, shabby, dirty, underfed woman, or else add to their wages by prostitution. Now, the whole thing about white slavery, there are all sorts of connotations with that to do with racism and other forms of prejudice, but there's a, a whole literature on it by itself, so I decided to leave it out for this talk. Anyway, the searches of the daily newspaper that I undertook that were reporting the various police courts during this period show that prosecutions of working class men were common. But if action was taken against middle or upper class men, it certainly wasn't made public because there's no trace of them. The language of a report in the Evening Herald in November 1913 suggests that men living off so-called immoral earnings were not only criminal, but were not truly masculine. After reporting on uh, this man um, who was found guilty, Charles Kane, of living off his wife's immoral earnings, the police gave evidence that he didn't have a job and that he appeared to have no other form of income. So Justice McInerney sentenced him to six months imprisonment with hard labour, remarking that it was an extremely bad case of immorality and revealed a most unmanly mode of obtaining a livelihood. So maybe he thought hard labour would make him more manly, who knows. But the White Slave Act referred to in the headline here refers to the Criminal Law Amendment Act 1912, which was passed after several stories that appeared, not just in uh, Ireland, but in Britain as well, of women being kidnapped for involvement in the sex industry. It's hard to know to what extent this was actually happening. Um, the reports were fairly lurid, but didn't seem to be hard on facts. So the problem probably was exaggerated for various reasons, not least the sale of newspapers, uh, but it did result in the passing of the act, which gave significantly increased powers of arrest to the police who suspected men of involvement in sex trafficking and brothel keeping. It also allowed for tough corporal punishment of convicted offenders, such as whipping in addition to prison sentences. So for once, the men involved in the trade were being punished rather than the women, but it didn't actually do anything to help the women who were being exploited. So this report from the Irish Independent in October 1915 refers to another meeting of the Catholic Truth Society at which the Countess of Fingal expressed her outrage at the state of immorality in the city of Dublin. She stated that she had been told on good authority that the state of the streets at night were not only a disgrace to Christianity, but to Catholic Ireland. Her sentiments were echoed by P.T. Daly, who was secretary of the Irish Trade Union Congress at the time, who said that fathers of families had reported to him that along the North Quays, from the Custom House to the end of the North Wall, it was impossible for them to allow the females of their families to go down there after nightfall. There are hints there about um, our relations that are rather unpleasant, but let's not talk about that. So the various vigilance groups that were set up, they seemed to feel quite free to comment on the lives and behaviour of women working the brothels and streets of Dublin, although they did occasionally concede that the overcrowded housing and the dreadful poverty in the city might have had something to do with the prevalence of immorality. But the many letters written to the Dublin newspapers about the situation focused mainly on the <coughs> foreign influence of the British soldiers in corrupting innocent Irish girls. They were blamed for the high levels of venereal disease in the city and other evils associated with the sex trade. But of course, if you go back to the 19th and early and the 18th century when this was being discussed, somehow um, there was a lot of venereal disease then and there weren't as many British soldiers, so maybe some Irish men were guilty of this kind of behaviour too. 
So in any case, there was a growing understanding that there were economic and social causes of prostitution, but this did not seem to influence the letter writers to newspapers who produced some very strange remedies for the problem. Some recognised that overcrowded tenements certainly had a role to play, but rather than tackle the appalling conditions in which many Dubliners were forced to live, they suggested that tenement dwellers should be isolated as one would deal with leprosy or smallpox, to quote one letter. Another writer suggested that every brothel should be marked, quote, as a plague spot with a red danger signal. Keep it in one locality, hide it from the gaze of our rising generation, unquote. With the outbreak of the First World War, the blame for rising levels of venereal disease and the failure to remove both soldiers and prostitutes from the street, streets was laid at the feet of young single women who were assumed to be clandestine prostitutes. If you didn't have a man to keep you under control, well, of course you must be a prostitute if you were living on your own. So some Irish suffragists used the situation on the streets of Dublin as the basis for a call to tackle the housing problem. But also they put forward the suggestion that women police should be appointed to deal with those females who were guilty of enticing soldiers to use their services. Anna Haslam and Mary Hayden, who were leading lights of the more conservative suffragist organisation, the Irish Women's Suffrage and Local Government Association, which was affiliated with the Women's Social and Political Union in uh, England, they were advocates of this proposal, which they said was purely preventative and wasn't intended to assist the prostitutes to find an alternative means of making a living. So it was okay to have this moral scrutiny going on, but you certainly weren't going to help the women get out of the situation they were in. So the patrols were composed of pairs of young women, presumably the sort of young women that Anine and Aaron had been calling to volunteer. They had to be able to afford to give two hours at least a week to carry out their duties. And these involved monitoring public places, separating couples thought to be embracing too closely, following those they expected might be about to embark on an unsavoury course of behaviour. I'm quoting there, by the way. There was clearly a class bias as these unpaid guardians of morality were appointed to interfere with the lives of poor women as the Irish worker assessed their role. Um, there were other ways in which Irish suffragists developed other forms of surveillance of their working class sis uh, sisters. But, you know, there was always this assumption that educated middle class women almost had a duty to monitor women who didn't come from the same kind of background. So restriction and control of working class women's sexual activities expanded even further as the war continued. In January 1916, a member of the uh, women's patrols, a Miss Mosher, formed the Dublin Watch Committee and became its secretary. It had a number of subcommittees dealing with different forms of vice drunkenness, immorality, lending, gabbling, acts by and against children. And it seems to have remained in existence until at least 1919. So it's not clear whether it gave up because of the War of Independence, which would have made the streets of Dublin <coughs> fairly dangerous, or whether they <coughs> saw the light, who knows. In any way, uh, the 1917, the Venereal Disease Act had been passed to prevent the treatment of venereal disease otherwise than by duly qualified medical practitioners and to control the supply of remedies therefore. And that was a reaction to uh, a lot of kind of home remedies or people who couldn't afford to go to doctors taking it into their own hands and it wasn't exactly solving the problem. So, the uh, Venereal Disease Act reflected the widespread panic about sexually transmitted diseases, which was prevalent in all parts of the United Kingdom at the time, not just in Ireland. But in Ireland, the association of British soldiers with the spread of venereal disease fitted the nationalist narrative as well as the suffragist movement. So it got greater traction 
in both the newspapers, but also the various journals that these organizations produced. With the foundation of the independent Irish state in 1922, the presence of the foreign scapegoat was no longer an issue. The new state, with insistence, its insistence on a Catholic identity, <coughs> continued to be preoccupied with women's sexuality and perceived transgressions of the behavior, behavior expected of so-called decent Irish women. And in the absence of British soldiers, the discussions continued. But this time, the focus was solely on containing the women. And as we know, the measures to break all the promises of the 1916 proclamation of equality and equal treatment and cherishing of the children uh, started to be broken almost as soon as that first common male government took over. And my suggest in some ways have continued ever since. But that's um, my personal opinion and not the opinion of Dublin City Council for whom I work. And so uh, thank you for listening. I'm sorry if this is a bit rushed, it's just because it's one of those days. But um, there's fascinating stuff that happened in the early decades of uh, the Irish Free State and then, of course, into even the, the Republic. Uh, including that brilliant document, the 1937 Constitution. So thank you. Thank you for listening to this podcast from Dublin City Libraries. The Dublin City Historians in Residence programme is brought to you by Dublin City Council and organised by Dublin City Libraries in partnership with Dublin City Council Culture Company.